Good morning, Mary Kay. Okay, folks, we're going to get started. We'll have a few other uh, people trickle in, I'm sure. Again, feel free to chime in in the chat. Um, if you have any questions throughout today's webinar, feel, feel free to ask those anytime. We will answer them uh, at the end of the webinar. So we'll kind of go through our intros first, discussion, and then we'll get to the audience questions at the very end. But please put them in the uh, Q&A at any time, or you can also add them to the chat. Um, again, if there's anything in the chat that you like, dislike, feel free to chime in, let us know. We, we're looking for community engagement and the, and the chat's a great use of that. Okay, so let's get started with the series. The Tourism Skill Shop is one of many educational or industry educational programs, in the state of Washington tourism. This webinar series will engage with colleagues across the tourism sector and broaden their industry knowledge, skills, and network. Each webinar, uh, we'll highlight a specific issue or skill for the tourism professionals to ponder and discuss with industry experts. State of Washington Tourism will typically host live webinars of the Tourism Skill Shop on the third Thursday of every month from 10 to 11 a.m. These webinars will also be recorded and shared with registrants. So if you can't make the webinar, be sure to sign up and watch it later. It's also on our YouTube uh, channel, State of Washington Tourism. Uh, for Tourism Skill Shop and other industry updates, visit SWT website, sign up for the industry update newsletter, and follow SWT on LinkedIn. Tourism stakeholders may also join the SWT Facebook group, that's fairly new, for further discussion on topics related to the Tourism Skill Shop and other industry news, issues, and events. So let's talk about uh, today's webinar. This is the second webinar in the Tourism Skill Shop, and we'll focus on best practices for festivals and events that drive tourism. In other words, how do planners and other tourism stakeholders broaden the economic impact of festivals and events and turn attendees into overnight visitors? The guest speaker for today's webinar come from across the state and their festivals and events range in size and scope. The guest speakers are Bruce Skinner, the executive director of the Washington Festivals and Events Association, Riley Stockton, the executive director at Spokane Hoop Fest, and Mark Abshire, the executive director at Port Angeles Regional Chamber of Commerce. Gentlemen, thanks uh, for joining us today. Um, their knowledge and experience in the planning process for festivals and events uh, will focus uh, and give us special attention on ROI, community collaboration and funding, as well as sustainability. I'm your host, Matt Azuna. I'm the Destination Development Manager at SWT. And uh, behind uh, Zoom is my colleague, Mike Moe. He's the Director of Strategic Partnerships and Tourism Development. He'll be working on the back end to kind of uh, take any questions and, and monitor the chat as the webinar progresses. So Mike, thank you. Let's talk about our guest speakers today. I want to give a brief intro to each one of them. Bruce is the executive director of the Washington Festivals and Events Association. I mentioned that earlier. He has a long and storied past in the events industry, especially as it relates to sports. Uh, Bruce served as the executive director at the Fiesta Bowl in Phoenix, Arizona. That's pretty cool. As well as the president of the International Festivals and Events Association. He is also a published author and founder of the Rock and Roll Marathons in Phoenix, Seattle, and San Antonio. Riley Stockton is the executive director of the Spokane Hoop Fest, which is the largest three-on-three -three basketball tournament in the world. In 2019, Spokane Hoop Fest brought over, or excuse me, around 6,000 teams and over 24,000 players to the streets of downtown Spokane. Before Hoop Fest, Riley worked for the Special Olympics, uh, USA Games in Seattle. And then there's Mark Abshire. He's the executive director of the Port, uh, Port Angeles Chamber of uh, Commerce. Fun fact about Mark, uh, his last assignment uh, with the US Air Force was at the Pentagon uh, as the speechwriter for the Secretary of the Air Force. It's pretty cool, Mark. He retired in 
20, or excuse me, 2002 from the Air Force as a Lieutenant Colonel and spent several years as a corporate communications executive with a variety of companies near the Washington DC area. Before moving back to the Olympic Peninsula in 2014, Mark served as a as the Vice President of Communications for uh, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. So that's awesome. Thanks, Mark. And thank you, uh, gentlemen, again, for joining us today. Um, before we dive into discussion, Bruce, I'm going to turn it over to you. I, I know you have uh, an update for us, a grant opportunity for folks on the call today, as well as other folks from across the state. How about you tell us more about the grant opportunity and a little bit more about the Washington State um, Festivals and Events Association? You bet, Matt. Uh, to, to start with, the Washington Festivals and Events Association is the trade association for festivals and events across the state. Very diverse membership, starting with you know, the Mariners and the Seahawks, but um, larger events like Seattle Sea Fair, the Capitol Hill Block Party in Seattle, Hoop Fest in Spokane, Bloomsday in Spokane, Water Follies in tri cities some large events to some very, very small events. Uh, the Bukota Spectacular in Bukota, Washington, um, uh, Lavender Festival in Squam, et cetera. We have uh, over 400 members. Um, if COVID de absolutely devastated the industry for obvious reasons, if in 2020, you know, 95% of events were not held in the state were canceled, and a lot of them canceled in 2021 also. So uh, industry took a serious hit. But if there's some good news, uh, the good news is is that uh, the event industry was recognized. I think prior to uh, COVID, many people thought, you know, no matter what the event was, whether it was Seafair or Bukota, that, you know, it's just put on by a bunch of volunteers and uh, doesn't generate a lot of in economic impact and et cetera. But what uh, a lot of people found out, especially if you were uh, owned a business in a, in a city and especially a hotel or a restaurant uh, in weekends when you were normally full because uh, of a particular event going on, uh, without them being there, they, you know, they had a lot of empty hotel rooms and a, a lot less business. So, for sure, yeah. uh, we've been recognized even more as as an industry. So, along with that, uh, the state, uh, in particular, the Department of Commerce, has recognized that the industry did take a serious hit. We really need to bring that industry back because they generate tourism not only you know, in large markets, but in very, very small markets, um, uh, all size markets in the state and put heads and beds. And um, so we have been chosen along with the Washington State Arts Commission to administer a $3.5 million grant. And the, uh, uh, what we've been given, the task we've been given is to uh, develop a grant program um, to support legacy level community events, those that have been there a long time, uh, other festivals, civic and holiday celebrations, cultural heritage events, music festivals, and streets and arts fairs in communities, also healthy lifestyle events. So uh, runs, marathon runs and, and bike events like STP and so forth. But it, it's been restricted by commerce to benefit those events and communities of less than 100,000 residents. Wow. So okay. they're aiming for um, you know, mid-level sized communities to small communities in the state. Um, uh, the, one of the criteria will be is that the event did have to cancel and is restarting. Um, and the grants awards are going to be between $5,000 and $35,000 based on the criteria that uh, is currently being developed. Um, the, uh, just a few other comments, and then we can turn it over to Mark and Riley. But um, uh, as I've said, festival events and been recognized by Commerce and many others do generate a significant amount of economic impact, um, putting 
uh, filling hotel rooms and and uh, increasing a significant amount of business activity when they're being held. You know, uh, and here's some examples. Uh, Seattle Center is the largest venue for uh, festivals and events in the state that hold 26 ethnic festivals and many other events. Um, Northwest Folklife, Bumbershoot, several others. Uh, they did an economic impact report and 17% of attendees to the Seattle Center come to attend one of those festivals. And by the way, the center generates $1.8 billion of economic impact mm -hmm. annually. And again, 17% of that comes from people who specifically come to attend a festival or event. And 58% of those attendees come from out of state. So nice. um, definitely some significant economic impact. Um, Seattle Rock and Roll, which this year will be in Bellevue, um, generates $36 million in economic impact each year. 1.7 million of that is taxes. So mm -hmm. they well pay for any city services. Um, and 63% of rock and roll marathon attendees come from out of state. Um, and then Hempfest in Seattle generates $18.1 million in economic impact, $1.2 million in taxes. So those are just, you know, a few examples. Uh, um, but, uh, and again, events of all shapes and sizes uh, generate economic impact. You know, in North Central Washington, we have the Winthrop Rhythm and Blues Festival. 80% of their attendees come from out of the area. Um, uh, and another incredible event in Spokane is Bloom's Day. Some years it's the largest uh, race in the world. Uh, they had uh, one year they had 60,000 runners um, and a third of them come from outside the area. Tri-Cities has the water follies, hydros attract a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, Vancouver, many events, Clark County Fair, uh, Anacortes boasts the Anacortes Arts Festival, which does a great job of uh, marketing to Canadians. Uh, Skagit Valley Tulip Festival, thousands travel from all over the Northwest to attend that. Uh, I mentioned the Bukoto Spectacular, the Razor Clamp Festival in Ocean Shores, the Lavender Festival in Swim. Um, but I think nobody uh, attracts uh, generates economic impact like the two speakers that we have today, which represent a small market and a large market. Um, as Riley has pointed out, Hoopfest is the largest three-on-three -three basketball tournament in the world. 6,000 uh, teams, many of them uh, come from out of the area, I think half. Um, and Mark Abshire from the Port Angeles Chamber. And, you know, a lot of events are established for other reasons. Um, uh, I'll, you know, a number of people might start a marathon race because they love running, but then the byproduct from that is that they generate a lot of tourists. That's right. Port Angeles is very aggressive about setting up events where the primary purpose is to draw people from out of town, especially during the off season, the shoulder seasons. Um, so from you know, I'd like to turn it over to Riley and Mark. Sure. Thanks, Bruce. And before I do, I, and I'll kind of ask the overarching sure. question in just a minute, but um, Bruce, can folks kind of reach out to you if they have any questions about the, the grant you just mentioned? Yeah, well, I'll post uh, uh, on on the chat our, uh, uh, our website address and my email address so people can reach out because we definitely will include them on our pretty robust mailing list of festivals and events throughout the state. The second thing is at this point in time, because of COVID and a lot of events are starting back up with no money, we're allowing people to join WFEA and learn about not only this grant, but other grants that are gonna be forthcoming from uh, other entities like the Washington State Arts Commission. You can join today for $50. So Excellent. Again, we'll post that information in the chat. And the grant timeline, um, are you seeking applications now or has that opened? What's Good the question. Deadline? It's scheduled to open June 8th and we're on target to hit that date. 
uh, you know, ne never know during the grant process, but I think we're on target to uh, get, as long as you're on your ma our mailing list, we'll get the information out to you. So. Excellent. All right. Thanks, Bruce. Well, Riley and Mark, how about I kind of turn it over to you? And I'm going to ask uh, this broad overarching question. Feel free to tailor it for your specific events and communities. Uh, and then, Bruce, we'd probably love to, to have you chime in, too. I mean, Bruce has done a great job, you know, talking about the what. All of these events and festivals across the state, Washington State has plenty of them. And we'll kind of dive into at least two uh, events or two destinations today, Riley up in Spokane and Mark in Port Angeles. So here's the question, gentlemen. How should or how have your communities think about long term sustainable festivals and events that maximize economic impact and quality of place. Who wants to tackle that first? And feel free if I need to kind of break, if we need to break that down into, into funding, into strategic planning, into marketing, I mean, you can answer it however you see fit. I, I can go first, Mark. And I think, you know, with Hoop Fest, this is going to be our 32nd year. So I'm not creating these plans but what's happened in the past is you know it started out solely as a basketball tournament right we had 512 teams but our goal was a lot more than that and I think what we did really well was create a place for everybody you know not everybody wants to play basketball on the streets of Spokane but I think what we tried to do is focus on families trying to get them involved and create a festival-like atmosphere um that everybody could enjoy. So we have um, activities throughout the day that have no relation to basketball. We have vendor booths, we have all this different stuff that want, you know, we want people to come in from out of town to enjoy Spokane. And if they play basketball, that's great. If they don't, they can still enjoy um, all the other things that we have going on downtown. You know, we have a lot of great partners throughout the community. Um, you know, I would say, at least initially, we started specifically with Spokane companies. You know, we were very focused making this a Spokane event, but as we grew, we started to get into more areas that were not just Spokane specific when looking for partners and sponsors. And that really helped us grow um, our attendance from outside, um, outside of the Spokane County area. Like Bruce mentioned, you know, I think early on, we were pretty much the majority of people that participated were Spokane people. Now we're about half Spokane people. I think in 2019, we had about 43 different states participate, in six different countries. So um, we're really trying to market now a little bit to everybody, but we definitely started out as a Spokane-centric company. And Riley, let me just follow up with that too. I mean, the growth of HoopFest over the years, um, has there been any kind of pushback from the community, whether in relation to, to just overcrowding, to, you know, um, garbage, uh, yeah. noise, traffic, I mean, you name it. Yeah, and I think we've had a little bit of all of that. I think what we try to do is proactively work with the city as much as possible. Um, you know, we start planning for Hoop Fest 2023 in July of 22. Um, we have lots of talks with city officials and, you know, there's a lot of condos in downtown Spokane. We are meeting with those associations um, basically as soon as Hoop Fest gets over just to, you know, have them a part of the conversation instead of when it's too late. So uh, it's really, really important to especially as you're trying to grow, is to work with your city official um, and try to get on the same page of them as them and have them a part of the discussion. You know, not just informing them what you're gonna do, but you know, we bring them in basically starting in January each month to go, hey, here are our plans. What are your thoughts? How can we improve? Um, and then they can give us their expert opinion. You know, a lot of our people are basketball people. Um, so we try to let the experts be experts in their areas. Excellent. Thank you. So Mark, tell us more about your, um, your festivals and events, how the economic impact is measured, how that um, enhances quality of place. And also, I mean, kind of Bruce touched on it earlier, um, facts and figures, ma making sure those are on your side, right? Right. So yeah, th thank you. And uh, so uh, I just want to first recognize that, you know, 
what you're doing here is awesome. Uh, thank you to you guys for organizing this. Washington State is such an, uh, a wonderful place to, to live. But as we all know, it's also a great place to visit. And that includes all, all of our rural, rural communities. Um, every small town has kind of a unique story. And the Port Angeles story and the North Olympic Peninsula really is, uh, of course, unique as well. And so, and that drives a lot of our decisions and a lot of our strategies around festivals and events. Um, just really quickly, Port Angeles sits, you know, on the top of the, of the uh, Olympic Peninsula there across from Victoria, Canada. We have that ferry that goes between Port Angeles and Victoria, but our proximity to the Olympic National Park is, is really key. So over the years, our, our town, like many others around the state, have had to pivot a little bit away from tim the timber industry and more toward tourism. So tourism has become a pretty, pretty important part of, of the Port Angeles and the North Olympic Peninsula story economically. Um, and so I think that's a lot of the reason why uh, we have so much, uh, we work so hard here on, uh, on our overall strategy uh, around festivals and events. Um, so the key to that is the fact that we really don't need any more people to come to our area in the months of June through September. Um, it's very popular here. We have tons of people that come. Um, we don't really have to work very hard. Uh, in fact, we don't want to work very hard to try to get more people to come here during those months. And so our focus has been for the last uh, several years on growing what we call growing our winter economy or the shoulder seasons that Bruce was talking about. And so strategically, uh, what we've done is um, at the lodging tax uh, advisory committee level, various jurisdictions in our area have taken the strategies of, for example, uh, emphasizing funding festivals and events that are not in the, in the main tourism season. So we're trying to de-emphasize growth uh, in, the, in, the, in the summer months and emphasize growth in the, in, the, in the other months. And then sort of economically, for long-term sustainability, which is kind of what your original question was. Correct, yep. Um, one of the things that they've done is, um, that we, many of the jurisdictions have done here is um, required festivals and events to wean themselves away from lodging tax funds over time. So uh, that frees up those dollars for other events and festivals that need lodging tax support to get started or to sustain um, and so we're really asking our, our festivals and events organizers to find ways over time to self-fund uh, and not require lodging tax dollars for support. So that's something we do that I think has made a big difference. Excellent. Well, I'm just curious, too. I, you know, I asked Riley this question, but I'll ask you, too. Have you, you know, faced any uh, significant pushback from residents or community groups to many tourists? Uh, too much traffic, um, crime, garbage, anything like that? How have you kind of responded? Yeah, our, our local community here uh, still welcomes uh, tourism with open arms. We haven't gotten to that saturation point where that some, some places get to that are truly suffering under over tourism. I would say we haven't gotten there yet. We're still welcoming everybody. In fact, when the Coho Ferry started back up between Port Angeles and Victoria, it was a big deal around here and everybody just really celebrated because we love uh, bringing our Canadians back across and, and going over there to Victoria, which is only 17 miles away from Port Angeles. So, uh, it, you know, we're, we're close to those Canadians and uh, it's a special relationship. So, but no, we, we don't really, uh, you know, there's, there's a little bit of, there's a little bit of traffic frustration during festival weekends sometimes, and the locals know to stay away from downtown Squim, for example, during the famous irrigation festival or the lavender festival. Those, those are the two big things they do in Squim. Um, uh, and so we just kind of stay away the, on those weekends, but it's not a big deal. Excellent. Well then, and Mark, maybe I should, and Riley and Bruce too, this is open for everyone, but what kind of a uh, key relationships or special relationships do event planners, organizations like yours have with other tourism stakeholders in the community? I assume you kind of go directly to the uh, DMO or the Chamber of Commerce, or maybe there's a, you know, a downtown or 
uh, business district or or things of that nature. How do you have you have those relationships kind of blossomed over the years, or how have you kind of uh, you know become a diplomat and kind of uh, coalesced a, a a coalition to support these festivals and events? Well, I can speak to that a little bit. Uh, so we work very closely with the local governments, you know, um, especially like I, I mentioned the lodging tax advisory committee. Uh, you know, we work very closely with them as well uh, on those strategies that I talked about. We also have um, the Olympic Peninsula v Visitors Bureau uh, that we that kind of helps coalesce all of us together. So I would say we kind of lean on that organization to keep us, you know, uh, gelled together and everybody sort of singing off the same sheet of music. Uh, that's been a very effective uh, um I guess the growth of that and the strength of that over, over the last several years has really been noticeable and they do a great job keeping us all together and uh, coordinated. It's very important, especially when you're trying to conceive of a new festival or an event and you wanna look at the calendar, you wanna to try to find the, the, the timing for when to have this event uh, to really have a full picture of your area and surrounding areas for impact, you know, and so, uh, organizations like your your regional visitors bureaus and stuff uh, really can help with that a lot. Well, yeah, I'm just thinking also in terms of sponsorships and other partnerships, yeah. right? Like Riley, that's what I was thinking about you. How do you kind of, you know, find all these partners Are you, or sponsors? You talked about local businesses. Who else is important in this kind of uh, event planning process? Yeah, so we we definitely work a ton with like Visit Spokane um, and the downtown. Uh, partnerships, but then we're also looking at downtown businesses. Um, you know, the Davenport Hotel is a huge sponsor for us, um, and it works great for both parties, right? You know, we're bringing in a ton of people, but we're also, uh, you know, a lot of people are bringing are going to be downtown. So, uh, I think it is vital, especially in whatever community you're in or whatever area of the city you're going to use, is to utilize those people that will be affected because I think it's really good for both parties, right? If you get them on board, it's great. Um, and then they're also involved in your event as well. Um, so that's been vital for us to really create those local downtown partners um, that have supported us for a long time. Good point. And Bruce, what about you? Do you have any um, helpful advice for uh, community relations in terms of these large festivals and events? Well, Riley just brought a key one up, and you know they partner with the Davenport Hotel. The hotel industry has become a major sponsor of hotels. I'm sorry, of festivals and events in the state for obvious reasons, uh, uh, because they benefit greatly from these events, and they realize that, and they realize that the more successful a festival or event is, the you know more revenue that they're going to generate. One of two ways. One uh, filling rooms um, and and also by increasing rates <laughs> if sure, a, sure. a is particular bus particularly busy uh, there's a lot of event weekends where you know hotels are able to charge more than they normally would true no no money talks for sure well then let's talk about marketing strategies uh, again, this is open for everyone. Maybe Bruce, we'll probably start off with you too. What marketing strategies would you recommend? And particularly, let's kind of keep it in the context of, of Washington State for perhaps like a small uh, rural community. What kind of marketing uh, strategies, recommendations would you have for these folks that are kind of under a tight budget or limited with the number of staff or partnerships in their communities? Um, I Most rural communities have access to LTAC revenues. And I'm a firm believer that at least part of that, uh, if you receive LTAC revenues, some of that should go towards uh, marketing expenses and marketing uh, to out of town areas. Um, Mark does a great job of that. Uh, the Anacortes Arts Festival uh, took their LTAC money and threw 100% of it into a marketing campaign to bring Canadians across the border. And there's another, a number of great examples. Uh, the Winter Rhythm and Blues Festival uses its LTAC revenue to attract people from uh, Snohomish King, you know, the heavily uh, populated uh, cities on the I-5 corridor. So 
there's some great examples of that. And again, LTAC revenues are available to help market and to uh, increase uh, the number of people coming from out of town. And that's a great partnership because Obviously, that helps the hotel industry, restaurants, other businesses. Correct. Yeah. Mark, did you want to chime in? Sure. I can say a few things. Uh, first of all, I, I think social media is, is a, a great way to market uh, inexpensively. Um, it's really important that you have somebody on your team. If, if, you're, if you're somebody like me who's too old to really get social media very well, uh, make sure you have somebody on your team who is uh, very strong at it. For example, uh, you know, depending on your audience who you want to attract, there's different social media tools that you'll want to use. Uh, if you want to attract the younger crowd, for example, Facebook is not going to help you uh, very much uh, and uh, these days. And so uh, there's, and then, but if, but if you're trying to get, you know, families and, you know, maybe a little bit older, older crowd, uh, Facebook can be extremely uh, helpful if you understand how to use the tools of Facebook um, well. So that's that's just one thought on uh, inexpensive marketing. Another suggestion I would make is um, is to consider um, your local publisher uh, to be a potential sponsor. So uh, they can often often they're interested in in supporting a community type festival or event with their own brand name. So if they can be a, identified as a sponsor, uh, your local paper or your regional publisher uh, can be identified as a sponsor, you'll often get advertising at, you know, uh, in their publications at reduced rates to like, you know, basically free. Uh, sure. So, uh, but don't rule out, you know, uh, asking your local publisher to be a, an actual named sponsor a lot of times they are interested in that sort of thing and they're just too busy to look for your opportunity so take it to them and, and suggest it and a lot of times i think you'll find uh they'll welcome you with open arms excellent thanks mark and riley what about you i mean you mentioned kind of broadening uh broadening your your audience to include not just basketball players but families how did how does that work for you yeah and you know i think both mark and bruce hit what we do on the head i think we use our ltac money or tpa money for facebook ads and that sort of thing and we just used all of everything we got towards marketing of the event and then we use our partners as well you know we have major media partners is what we call them um, there's a local paper um, a local newscast and so when we need to push something we go through them also, when we have a story for them or something that's happening with HoopFest, then they get the first dibs or first right of refusal for it. Um, so we try to be good partners in that way. The other thing is I would create something um, that makes your event stand out each year or something that people can collect. Ours are HoopFest posters. Um, you know, we have 32 of them and, you know, there's a variety of people that have been on them. Local legends, NBA players, community members all that sort of thing. And now it's kind of a collector's item. So if you walk the streets of downtown Spokane or really any part of Spokane, you'll see our HoopFest poster for HoopFest the 32nd year this year everywhere. Um, and it's just kind of an organic way to get community members involved. And it's, you know, fairly cheap to print a poster out these days. So, um, you know, it started a little bare bones and now we've kind of increased it over the years, but, you know, we have got, you know, for example, our people on the poster this year are the two twins that played at Stanford in, uh, that won a national championship, you know, huge community recognition. And it's great for us. You know, when they see that poster, they not only think of how great the twins were at basketball, but then also Hoop Fest as well. So trying to do it organically, especially when you're on a budget, um, is really important. Excellent. And so we've talked about, um, we've talked about coalitions, we've talked about partnerships, we've talked about marketing, economic impact. What are some metrics? What metrics should communities use to measure success of festivals and events? Mark, or excuse me, how, let's start with Bruce. Bruce, do you have any um, words of wind, wisdom on, on this aspect, not only to collect data, but then to interpret it and then feed that to the press, elected officials, community members? How do we do that? Well, to start with, uh, economic impact uh, studies are a little difficult for events to do, especially if they're free. Um, 
it's a and so therefore people are walking on to the site from all from all different entry points and therefore it's difficult to gauge what the attendance is but you can do uh, studies that and hire people that will do that and the industry needs to do that a lot more um, as we're all realizing we have to justify our existence to city officials because we're using police and we're using traffic and um, and we need to do a better job of that. WFEA does have a program where, at, I, which is pretty low cost, engaging economic impact. And again, you can email me uh, information's in the chat and I can give you information on that. But, you know, events are held for a, a lot more reasons than just to generate an economic impact. If you hold a marathon run, Obviously, obviously, that's a that they're called healthy lifestyle events and encourages people to get in shape um, and become healthier um, to, you know, celebrating what a community might have, um, you know, Squim has lavender, uh, uh, you know, Winthrop uh, has some jazz performers and and um, you know, certainly Spokane has a basketball tradition. Um, so, you know, I think uh, celebrating what your particular community might have uh, is a, another important reason to hold an event. Great. Mark, you talked about um, research and data earlier. Can you touch on that again? Sure. Uh, so a couple of things. If you're, if you're looking for like empirical data, uh, that you can use to, you know, uh, request more funding or just to report success or, or whatever. Um, I highly recommend looking for ways to collect that data online. So much is available on the internet now and, and to get your participants and your volunteers to participate in your festival or your event uh, online. And I don't mean in, 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 uh, in not, not showing up. What I'm, what I'm getting at is that for example, uh, it's really great uh, to track your volunteers, number of hours that they contribute, number of volunteers, uh, those type, types of things. And it's really easy to do that if you use an online system to have them sign up for their volunteer shifts as opposed to just doing it the old fashioned way. Um, and so there's some really great software out there uh, that you can use to get to, you know, for people to sign up for volunteer shifts and that sort of thing. And that software will help you also uh, report out, you know, how many hours you garnered. And that can be actually really very impressive and a good way of telling the story about the success of your event or festival. Right. Look at all yes. the volunteers, you know. So we use, we typically use Sign Up Genius here, but there's many, there's many others, uh, but that, that works really well for us. Um, and then the, as far as participants go, if you have any aspect of your event that requires any kind of like, you know, waiver or some sort of permissions, um, I'm sure that Riley, you know, probably has a waiver for his participants, anything that requires any kind of sporting activity or anything like that, or ride maybe, uh, that kind of thing. If, if there's any waiver uh, potential, um, you get your participants to fill out the waiver. And, um, in the waiver process, and it's an online waiver. If you just do a, a, a paper waiver, that's not going to help you really. But there's great online waiver programs that um, they can do it very quickly. They can do it with their mobile phone. They can scan the QR code, you know, and in a matter of less than a minute, they can have, they have their waiver signed. Meanwhile, in the software of that waiver program, you can put a required field in there that um, where they put in their hometown um, zip code. Uh, and it's something we do here and uh, for a lot of our events. And so we can tell you exactly where people came from uh, with just those five digits. You don't really need their full address or you don't really need, you don't really want their email address necessarily. Some people don't like to give their email address, but they don't mind giving you their five digit zip code of their hometown. And that's an easy ask and it's an easy thing to fill out. Meanwhile, you've got very valuable data that you can go back to, you know, post event and say, look, we, you know, here's a map. You can actually, uh, you know, spread it all the spread it out on a, on a on a visual map to show where everybody came from. So it's 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 a, those are that's that's a recommendation I have for for uh, 
collecting empirical data. Excellent. Thanks, Mark. Riley, what about you? Do you have anything else to chime in on that topic? No, you know, our data is team signups. You know, that's going to be driving our um, tournament quite a bit. Um, you know, the economic impact is really tough, as Bruce mentioned, because we have no one way in, one way out. You know, you enter from one of the 45 different city blocks we have that we cover. Um, and, you know, some people head down to the park, some people don't, all that sort of thing. So um, I do think it is vital um, just to kind of hammer Bruce's point, if you're able to do an economic impact, you know, we have to do one um, to kind of prove our value for the city. You know, the, the city's giving us 45 city blocks. We need to show what we're bringing in. Um, so that economic impact drives a lot of our conversations throughout the year. So um, if you're able to, and they're, you know, they're expensive. I know Bruce has different ways to go about it. Um, that really helps when you have those tough discussions with city officials or downtown partnerships and that's and you of. mentioned earlier that you partnered with uh, visit spokane and they help also with some um, mobile data geolocation data as well right or is that mark earlier can't remember i think um, that might have been mark yeah 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 it's a different a different uh different tool but yeah we different we partnered with the city on that yeah excellent yeah and i will say that i you know, I'd, I'd be wrong if I didn't do a quick plug for my former employer, Destinations International. Destinations International does have an event impact calculator. Bruce, you're, Bruce, you're probably familiar with the event impact calculator, uh, but that's at cost. Uh, I remember years ago, US Travel also had like a very simplified event uh, economic impact calculator. I'm not sure if that's still around. I remember uh, utilizing yeah, that in grad school. Know, th those, are, those are good, but the calculation isn't the exact expensive part of the process. Uh, the expensive part of the process is determining how many, what's your attendance, how many sure. people yeah. came from out of state, how many of them stayed in a hotel, how many days did they say, stay? Uh, that's, you know, that's data that you need to collect. And, you know, and, and it's, and again, for a free event, it's a lot more difficult to do. It's, it's doable. But, sure. you know, when I was with the Rock and Roll Marathon, it, in much like Riley, it was very easy because everybody had to register for the race. So we could gather any information we wanted to as part of the registration, and we were able to do economic impact studies that way. Um, uh, but again, for free events, it's more difficult. Uh, one thing that has, I think, aided the industry uh, greatly is that if you charge for your events, and again, a lot of them are free, but if you do charge, online ticketing, uh, a good online ticketing company can really help you um, gather data because not only would they help you gather data, but those are your best customers next year. Sure, yeah. You now you're able to email them 11 months out with discounts or whatever to attend, so. Excellent, no, I totally agree. Well, we've hit our time discussion time, I want to turn it over to the audience, let them chime in. I have a few other questions that I can kind of pull in uh, if needed, especially one about COVID. Uh, but Mike, I'll turn it over to you now. How's the chat and how's the, uh, the Q&A? Yeah, we're good. We're, we're, we're in the chat. Nobody's used the Q&A, but we're, we're, people are asking a few, few questions in the, uh, the chat. Uh, Debbie asked, how much do you pay for the sign-up software? Hopefully one of you can understand exactly what you're saying there. Uh, yeah, we, so we, we all, we are, we have a pro plan with Sign of Genius and I believe it's about $20 a month, something like that, which isn't, which isn't too bad. Yeah. And then Matt Wakefield, uh, and we actually were talking about this before the meeting, is anyone using geolocation data for estimating attendance at ungated unregistered events? And Mark, I believe you, you got, we, yeah, we have, we have used, uh, uh, a, a company called Buxton before uh, for some of our events. We don't have that contract any longer, but um, yeah, we've used uh, Buxton. They're very good. And I think there, there are other, uh, I think Datafy is another one that Mike mentioned. Um, there are other companies that you can uh, use. They're very effective. They use mobile data, mobile phone data. Um, and uh, they can, they can off, they can tell you, you know, where those phones are registered to. So that's a little bit of hometown information there as well. So, um, it can be a little spendy, but uh, 
to get access to that. But you might be able to find, like we just topped on our local city contract, so it didn't cost us anything. But yep. it's also why we don't have access to it anymore. <laughs> well, one thing you should know is we do have a, a contract with Datafy, uh, State of Washington Tourism does, and we have negotiated down um, uh, for local communities. So if you are interested in this kind of data, you, you might consider Datafy as, as an option, and we can help you um, uh, make that connection. Um, let's see, can you address uh, the requirement of JLARC reporting? Does anybody have that one? Mary Kay, does anybody have to, to? I mean, was it like, why is there a requirement or why is it so, why is it so uh, vague and difficult to, uh, to follow through on or what's the, I'm not sure what Mary Kay means by that. Well, do you, do you, do you have to report to JLARC for? Yeah, the JLARC requires uh, anytime, anytime they use lodging tax funds, uh, you have to uh, re report back uh, to, on, 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 uh, on those numbers that you either estimate or, or in some way you got to estimate at least um, what the impact of those of the spending of those dollars was, and so that's I think what Mary Kay is talking about. I don't think it's going away, and I'm not sure. So we've talked about this a lot. I, I don't know that there's a better way to do it, um, but uh, you know somebody should maybe take a look at maybe there's a better way to capture the impact of the spending of those dollars. But right now that's all we've got. Mary Kay says, yes, can we ever get rid of it? But uh, I'm like, <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. I think if we could, we would have done that a long time ago. Uh, yeah. Derek asks, do you ever recommend using lodging tax to improve infrastructure that supports events rather than sponsoring the event operations or marketing? That's a good question. So we, we do locally here. Uh, we have... Uh, we, we, uh, one of our jurisdictions, the Port Angeles City uh, Lodging Tax, actually they have set aside a certain percentage that goes toward capital investments. Uh, they also set aside. Uh, I know Riley was talking about the the, uh, the cost of um, you know you know uh, support from first responders and sort of that that sort of thing. That, that there's a cost associated with your event. Um, that's already built into the to the lodging tax funds when they do that. So that's how they. That, that's part, I guess that's kind of an infrastructure aspect of funding events and festivals. They've already got it built in so that, you know, that's already taken out. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think it's probably a good idea to set aside maybe 10% or a certain percentage of, of, of your overall lodging tax budget for infrastructure and capital improvements in your community that support festivals and events. Cool. Um, yeah, and Marsha chimes in, JLARC requires municipalities report back on all lodging investments and it dates back 10 plus years. And uh, Yeah, not, not going away. Not going away. Uh, I, I have my own question. What kind of advice would you give uh, to folks where they want to start an event, like the very beginning? How do you get a, an event off the ground at the grassroots level? Well, I've done a few of those, so maybe I can talk to that a little bit. Um, the first, the, the probably the most important aspect of that, I, I in my opinion, is is your timing. So you want to do a mushroom festival. Uh, what you know, when would when would it be a good time to do that? And for example, uh, and, and you know, in Port Angeles area, North Olympic Peninsula, um, we're hoping that you don't want to do it in. June through September. No, we're not really welcoming any new events in those timeframes. So uh, the timing is very important, both in terms of where it sits in the seasons of your local community, um, but also so that it doesn't conflict with other uh, events that are going on uh, that might be a, a competitor, right? So um, I do think that a lot of your success or failure of your new event is going to rest a lot on your timing. You know, when, when is it actually happening? Think about the audience you want to attract. Does the timing support that? That's a big deal. And then the other, the other uh, as you're getting it started, um, the other huge consideration is, is your budget. So is this, is, this a fee, is this feasible? Is this a, something that we can actually do? Um, an example in, in Port, Port Angeles, there was there was a group of people that wanted wanted a an ice skating rink and over the holidays in downtown Port Angeles, 
we took a look at it and it just did not pencil out financially. So we just decided, you know, that's not going to work. And then people kept clamoring for it. And so what we ended up doing was uh, a really serious pro forma process where we really looked at exactly what it was going to take financially. And what we found is that if we had enough volunteers to do this, and if we had enough sponsors in our local area who wanted to fund, help us fund it, we could actually pull it off. And uh, so we, we, we took the leap and we built an ice skating rink here in Port Angeles uh, four years ago. And uh, it's been a huge hit here ever since, but it was only as the result of a very serious financial, um, you know, uh, research study that we did, you know, are we going to actually be able to pull this off? And now we're at the point, and we did get lodging tax funds to help us out. Right. Uh, but in the, this last season that we just had, we used zero lodging tax dollars uh, for the, for the ice rink, ice village. So, um, you know, that, that's a program that's working really, really well. I've uh, uh, started a lot of events also. And what, if I wanted to start an event, typically what I would do is find a good example of the type of event uh, that I wanted to start and go visit it and see it in person and visit with the event organizers because you can uh, cro uh, cross a lot of hurdles by doing that and, and lessen your chances of making mistakes. Um, then I also went to the Washington Festivals and Events Association Conference because all of the top event organizers, or most of them in the state, are there. And uh, if I wanted to start a particular event, I could talk to several people on how they did it. So uh, the nice thing about the events industry is, for the most part, we're not in competition with each other. So people are very willing to share their ideas. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm a firm believer in stealing ideas. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Sure. Uh, one other question for you, Bruce, kind of going back to the, the grant opportunity that's coming up. You, you said, when, when, it, when does the grant open again? June 8th, you said? It is scheduled to open June 8th, yes. And they can apply through your organization. How long is the grant open? The grant will be open for, it hasn't been determined yet, but it's going to be about three weeks. And it's a short time frame. And the reason is uh, we want to get the money out as soon as possible because events are happening now. You know, through a normal process, uh, you know, it would be five or six months before you get checks out to people. But, you know, we want to get them out a lot quicker than that because uh, so people can have the revenue as soon as possible. Do the events need to take place in 2022 or they can go, can they go into 2023? Um, they will probably have had to have happened at some point in time in 2022. Uh, so it'll be retroactive okay. uh, to January 1 is what I'm guessing. That hasn't been determined yet, but that's, that's what I'm guessing that the event will have had to have happened sometime in 2022. Great. And Caitlin asks, where can we find the RFP? And I think what you, you're asking for yeah, them to email you and you'll get the information. Yeah, my, my, yeah, email's in the chat and I'll make sure you get on the list. Great. Matthew, you have any more final questions before we close out? Yeah, I think it would be wrong not to ask a COVID-19 question. I, you know, it's, we, we feel like we've kind of made our way through the pandemic, but this thing is still lingering with us. And so the largest event here is probably Hoop Fest in Spokane. You know, Riley, just really quickly, any kind of, and you can kind of tie this in with any parting words, and this goes for Mark and, and Bruce, but I'm just kind of thinking of a large event in COVID-19. Granted that this is a, a warm weather event, but I mean, I, I assume you still have to kind of take into account COVID-19, risk management, liabilities, things of that nature. Any good advice kind of going forward for smaller events uh, to, thinking of, to think about COVID-19 and risk assessment? Yeah, I mean, we have, so our biggest sponsor is MultiCare, um, a hospital in this area, and I believe it's on the west side of the state as well. Um, so we work a ton with them, but then we also work with our regional health district as well, making sure we're making all the right necessary uh, plans to make sure everybody is safe. 
Um, so we are, you know, having these conversations as soon as possible as things are changing um, to make sure our event can happen this year. I think that's the vital thing is we want to do everything in our power to make sure our event after two years can happen again. And so then we're trying to be extremely proactive on, hey, what's going on? How can we adjust our plans and go from there? So really work with your regional health district um, because they kind of control and have all the right information um, for you to base your decisions on. Well put, yes. Mark, Bruce, any comment on COVID-19 or parting words? I would echo what Riley said. I think it's really important to work with your local uh, health officers. Um, I'm, I'm a believer in to do what they tell you to do and, and not to do any less, uh, certainly, but also you don't necessarily have to do more because you're doing what a public health, you know, an expert in the field is, tell, is telling you to do regarding uh, COVID or anything else. And uh, so very important to work with local health districts. And Spokane's got a really good one, so. Yeah, I, I agree with both of you guys. Um, and I would just add that it's, I highly recommend that you establish a close relationship with your local health, health community, health officers. Um, you know, just let them let them understand that you rely on them and that you're that you really uh, are going to listen to them. Um, that will be that will pay dividends to you, I, I, I believe. Um, the other thing to consider, though, is um, COVID-19 hasn't hasn't gone away yet. And what we're finding is that it's impacting um, a little bit. It's impacting participation on the part of some people that you normally would get in terms of numbers. But the bigger one to be aware of and to be keep your eye on is volunteers. Uh, so, so many of us rely on volunteers for the success of our events and festivals. Um, and a lot of our volunteers are elderly uh, and vulnerable. Um, and so they're gonna, you're, you may see an impact on the availability of, of volunteers. So plan for that. Uh, you know, don't, you know, you, I don't think you're gonna o uh, overestimate the impact on your volunteer base right now still. It's great advice. I'd say over recruit those volunteers. You know, that's yeah. what we're trying to do. Um, Bloomsday ran in, you know, Bloomsday's our, you know, kind of our other big event in Spokane. And they had trouble when it got down to it of people canceling or people getting sick right before their event that they couldn't participate. So it's been our huge focus over the last month is to over recruit the volunteers necessary. Excellent. Thanks, Riley. And thanks, Mark and Bruce and Mike. Uh, this was a fruitful discussion today. I, I got a lot from it. I hope our audience did as well. If there's any questions that we didn't address today, your email addresses will be in the follow-up email after uh, this webinar. A recording to the webinar will be in that email as well. I assume it's okay for folks to reach out to you and ask any other questions, comments, concerns. All right. Great. Thanks. And thank you folks for joining in uh, from wherever you are in Washington State and beyond. Uh, just a quick plug for our June Tourism Skill Shop, the third or fourth Thursday of the month. We'll be focused, uh, that webinar will focus on search engine optimization. That's good for uh, event organizations, DMOs, restaurants, hotels, you name it. Everyone can use SEO. So uh, stay tuned for that, more details to come. And thanks again, have a good day. Talk to you soon.